Um, okay, we're gonna pick up the story um, where we left last week. The story of Balaam. And uh, it's already part three. And uh, as I was going through this and stumbling upon more details, I can already tell you there will also be a part four. But I think that's about it. Um, but there's so much in meaning uh, and, and uh, lessons in there that we can uh, use. And um, especially for the, the end times church that we are. So, um, we've seen uh, last week how Balaam went uh, on his way uh, against God's will. God was angry and uh, tried to make him uh, come to his senses and return by using this, this donkey. And um, eventually uh, yeah. narrowing him in. So if you go through the steps that God undertook to to get um, Balaam to his senses to return, then he, actually there are seven steps. And it's very interesting. I just noted this at some point when I was recapitulating it for myself. And um, we will see today that Balak, today or next week, <laughs> that Balak also gets seven steps presented to him to return from his evil way. And this shows again that God is at work. The number seven we see it returning all the time. But the first time that uh, God speaks to, um, to Balaam is when Balak has sent his, uh, his princes, his messengers to him. And then in the night Balaam gets a vision. And God says, you shall not go. You shall not curse these people because they are blessed. That was very clear. And it should have been enough. It should have been enough for um, Balaam to know this is something I just simply should not do. Period. But he um, was going for the riches. And so he sent these people back. And new ones came. And then God said, only if they call you, if they wake you up, if they call you, then you go. But you do what I said. Well, they didn't call him. He woke up by himself and he went. So this was the second time. And then he was on the, on the road. So this was what we saw last week. In the beginning the road was, uh, the, was wide. And the donkey turned off the road into the field. That was the first warning. The maybe wake up call that Balaam could have taken heed to. He didn't. He beat the donkey and the, it went on. Then God narrowed the road between these walls in this, um, this vineyard. And uh, he was crushed, his foot was crushed against the wall. Uh, it still didn't wake him up to, to stop and return. No, he was uh, continuing. That was the fourth time. And then the fifth time, the, the path was so narrow that um, he couldn't even turn around. And the donkey simply went uh, on his knees. That was uh, the moment uh, in, in where, where someone is so... Uh, taken captive in his sinful way uh, that he cannot even get out himself. That's when he should have called upon the Lord and repented and God would have taken him out. But he didn't again. That was the fifth time. The sixth time uh, was when the donkey began to speak. Now God took very um, severe measures. This was extreme. But still he didn't, uh, he didn't shake him. To, to see God was working and to return. And then God opened his eyes. That was the seventh time. And the angel, God spoke through the angel uh, directly to him. And both the donkey and the angel confronted Balaam with his errors. Um, but in both cases, he, uh, he continued on his path. Eh? Remember, he said then at, in the end, um, well, maybe if it displeases you, should I go back? And of course, this was not sincere at all. It was actually still trying to to push and to so that he could continue on his mission. And then the last thing we read um, was uh, from um, chapter 22, uh, verse um, 35. Eh? That's where then the angel says, "Go with the man, but only the word that I shall speak, 
unto thee that shalt thou speak. And so Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now this is of course in the, in the background of the whole story last week. He was there on the donkey with his two servants. But there was also this, these princes and these high uh, ranked people from Balak. They were going in front. So he had also of course a bit of pressure. He could not tell to them, well I changed my mind, I go back. The, he had also this pressure on him. And uh, this is often also what we have when, um, when we are um, in sin. Um, there are people uh, and situations around us that we have to turn our back to. And um, that creates pressure. And Satan will use that, of course, to prevent us from making these decisions. And so uh, these are very recognizable things. So he is not willing to turn. He continues his perverse way, as God calls it. He's determined he sees only what uh, the reward that is waiting him and uh, he is wicked and he is godless and in spite of what you will read in many commentaries about Balaam he was not a prophet of God uh, at least not, uh, not willingly and not uh, because he was such uh, a holy man now then we continue in uh, chapter 22 verse 36 and um, there it says, And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto a city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, which is in the utmost coast. So if you go back to the map that um, <coughs> I gave the first uh, part, you see um, Moab. Moab is where um, Balak is, eh, where he's king. And um, north of that is Ammon. And Ammon is the part where the Israelites are. So in, in Numbers 21, chapter 21, we didn't read that, but there is where Moses requests the king of, uh, of Ammon to pass through their land, because they, they want to get to the other side of the Jordan. That's the promised land at that point in time. Uh, but uh, the king of the Amorites says no, and he takes up the sword and tries to to defeat them, but um, actually he gets defeated and Ammon um, yeah, gets uh, destroyed and the, the, the Israelites are now camping there on the border um, of Moab and Ammon. Um, Balak can see them and he, that's why he became afraid. So now that's where they are on this northern, this, this, uh, of these two yellow lines that I draw there, the, the top one. That's where, where they are, on the border. And um, in verse 37, And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not uh, earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? So here, this is the first time these two men met. Eh? Um, they have heard of each other, obviously. Um, but this is the first time the, the devourer and the devastator, as the, the meaning of the names is, they meet. And they team up. But first of all, Balak is king and he is not very pleased that um, Balaam didn't come right away. And remember the distance from, from Moab to, um, to Pathor, where, where Balaam lived, it is 400 miles, 640 kilometers. It was a long journey. There was a lot of time between the first time that Balak sent his messengers away and this moment where he's finally there. Uh, weeks must have passed, if not months. And so um, he is, uh, he's a bit irritated. Um, and he reminds Balaam of his reward. Am I not able to promote you to great honor? He doesn't even speak about the gold and the silver, but about the honor. And uh, this is actually also what... Uh, what Balaam um, apparently has most on his mind. The riches, yes, but more than that, he, he anticipates that he can become governor or, or maybe even king uh, of, of parts of that area. So then in verse 38, uh, Balaam answers and he says unto Balak, Lo, I am common to thee. Have I now any power at, at all to say anything? The word that God put it in my mouth, that shall I speak. Uh, basically he says, don't grumble, I'm here now, let's get to business. Uh, I'm here, don't I have power, you know it. But then he adds, what God says, that, will, that shall I speak. 
and um, that will become more true than he even um, wishes it to be. Uh, also, with that, he actually is blaming God in a way for the fact that he didn't come right away. I have to do what God tells me to do. Uh, he's blaming God indirectly. And def then Bala can, of course, not say anything anymore. Um, I want to briefly go to Psalm 119, verse um, 17. Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I may live, and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. This is what this, the, the sincere servant of God uh, wishes and gets. His eyes will be open so that he can um, understand and um, proclaim God's word, God's law, God's instruction. Here we see a, a false servant. His eyes were opened. He, he could see God, the angel uh, of God with the drawn sword. But um, he doesn't get. Uh, he doesn't really get it. His eyes had been opened, but he chose, in spite of that, to be to rebel and not to be this this servant that um, may live <coughs> and keep the word. So the, what happens then? Verse thirty-nine, uh, back in Numbers twenty-two, and Balaam went with Balak, and they came into Kiriat Huzot, and Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. So this place that they mentioned there, it's again it's on this um, uh, on this top yellow line in the map, um, very um, westward near to the to the top of the the Dead Sea there um, at the height of J uh, Jerusalem. So it's very near to actually where the Israelites were, because they were opposite Jericho, on the east side of the Jordan. So uh, that's where they are. And um, uh, what happens, Balak makes sacrifices, he's offering. It's not because anyone tells him to do, but he has here the most powerful enchanter of the world. This is how he still sees him. That's why he sent for him, he did all this, um, this effort. So he thinks he should now do something to get his, um, his, his favor and um, to make things go well between them. And also to show that uh, his uh, irritation that he expressed before, that it is okay now and they can, they can team up to get to business. So he is offering there and um, he sends portions apparently of this, um, of this offering to Balaam and to uh, the, the people that... Uh, are there with him. So now, um, now they can get to business. Uh, he has pleased the prophet or the, the diviner, and he has pleased the gods. Small g. Now they can get to business. So we go to verse forty-one, and it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Now, we see a few things. Um, first of all, they agreed to that there was a need for sacrifices to please the gods. You know, it is not God not Yahweh, that they are trying to please. Um, well, in a way it is, uh, as we, we saw before, Balaam is, is um, an enchanter he, who, will, who will use any god he needs for the job to be done. In this case, he is up against Yahweh. So, yeah, in a sense, they bring uh, sacrifices to him. But where are they? Verse 41 of chapter 22. They are on the high places of Baal. This is a specific place high on the mountains where uh, normally um, Baal would be worshipped. This, um, this is the enemy's grand, uh, ground. It's basically Satan's territory where they are. This might probably also explain why the Israel, Israelites who were down below were not alarmed by seeing up there some activity and, and probably smoke from the sacrifices that they were doing. 
because this was probably what was happening all the time there. It was a place of worship and sacrifices to Baal. So that's where they were. And um, they were trying to please God. Um, so that God would put this curse in Balaam's mouth. He had said just before, only the thing, the word that God put it in my mouth, I shall speak. Now what you also see is that there is an abundance of sacrifices. He doesn't say build an altar and we bring a sacrifice. Balaam knew the stories, the history of, of Israel. We, we saw also that he came from the area where Abram uh, lived for quite a while. Uh, all the, the, the women um, in the history of Israel, um, they came from that place, that area uh, where Balaam also came from. He knew the history. He knew the stories of um, the flood of Noah, who built an altar after the, f uh, the flood, um, of um, Abram, who built altars, and so did uh, Isaac and Jacob, and even Moses, after they had crossed the Red Sea, um, they built altars in the desert. This, this was already for, for decades going on. So these stories were known in the area. He knew this was how you please God. And he did not do what all of these men did, but he did what all of these men did combined. He did not do what they did, build an altar, he built seven altars. <coughs> he was to be better than all of them, obviously. And um, it reminds us even of uh, Cain and Abel. Abel made as an altar, he sacrificed to God, and um, so did Cain. And what you see here is that they make the sacrifice of Abel with the heart of Cain. And that is actually what is happening. And um, it shows also, if, if we continue, that it is not this outward act that God that pleases God. It is the heart behind it that pleases God. Uh, or uh, uh, that he despises. And that is what we see in the story of Cain and Abel. In... Uh, and, and the words that God spoke to, to Cain after um, he made his sacrifice, they could be spoken right now to Balaam the same way. In, in Genesis 4, in verse 7, it is after, um, or verse 6 maybe, if after, after Cain um, is, is, uh, is wroth because God does not accept his sacrifice, uh, and again, it's not because of the sacrifice, it's because of his heart, uh, then God says um, to Cain, Why are you wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? And then it comes, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. If, if what you did is okay, keep your head up high. There's nothing to, to worry. But if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Bit difficult language, but it means you must you must rule over sin. You must master it. That is the warning that God gives to Cain, and he doesn't take heed of it. He allows sin to come in and um, even to make him kill his brother. The same happens here with uh, Balaam. Um, he doesn't master sin. He he indulges in it. He goes after it. Seven bullocks, seven rams are being sacrificed. The shedding of blood was uh, intended by God for the remission of sins. That is uh, what we see all the way from Genesis uh, until, until the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus brought on the cross. And here we see two men shedding blood without um, any feeling that they are in sin, without um, any desire to uh, move away from it and without any repentance in their hearts. This cannot be accepted by God. And then they do it on top of that on, um, on Satan's territory, if you will, on, on ba the high grounds of Baal. And I get back to this place because it's important. So verse 3, chapter 23. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go, peradventure the Lord will come to meet me. And whatsoever he showed me, I will tell thee. And he went to a high place. So he went a bit further up the mountain, apparently. And he says, you stay here with all these altars and this burning. And I will consult 
God, Yahweh. Uh, he keeps, he makes this whole theater there on the mountain, and all these these princes, and they are there, and they expect, of course, something. After all, they did so much uh, effort, and they had to wait so long for the most powerful enchanter of the world to come to them. Now it's going to happen. So he makes this whole theater, and he's going a bit higher to speak to God, and. Um, Probably and apparently he believes himself that God will be on his side. After, after all, he paid him and gave him all these sacrifices. And this is the type of spirit that thinks you can buy anything. And, and so he is truly, as Peter writes, he's a madman. He's insane. He's insane. And he goes through. Then in uh, verse uh, 4, And God met Balaam. And he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. So here is God again, the same God he had met on the road in the form of an angel with a drawn sword ready to, to, to kill him, basically. Uh, now he thinks he has gotten uh, his favor again by these uh, seven um, altars and the sacrifices on it. Um, he is all the time, from the very beginning, as we have seen, and he will continue to do so, he is negotiating. He is trying to, to buy his way in, to buy his favor in, to get eventually what he wants, more riches and power. And I've said it every time, and I uh, keep repeating it, this is this the idea, the art of the deal. Eh? He is in it, and he thinks it's, um, it's okay. And it's also um, interesting to see, uh, this is why I think many um, uh, Bible commentators um, think somehow that Balaam is a, is a righteous prophet of God uh, that had an error that is corrected. God meets him. So you think it works, it's okay, God meets him. But we've seen on, on uh, the, the last step uh, on the road that um, when God appears as an angel, that, that the angel says to him, just go with a man. Uh, he takes away these hedges of protection from him, and they are gone now. So he is in completely unprotected area. Uh, what he's doing is is it's utterly self-destructive. He's he's facing God, um, uh, so to speak, and uh, and he's just playing around as if he's dealing with uh, with a child, and um, so. We'll see that um, God just allows this to go on for his purpose. Um, but to Balaam, it must have raised hope. See, God meets me, he is on my side. I got him back on my side. So he continues in verse 5, Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth <coughs> and said, <coughs> and said, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou speak. God doesn't say what he shall speak. He says, there's a word, he will speak it. Just go back and do your job. So, Balaam um, must have thought, now I'm going to speak a curse. And I will get my rewards. And that's it. Uh, but um, he would probably, even if he had some notion already of what God wanted him to say, he would probably think, I will, I will trim these words, I will change it. That's what he had done from, right from the beginning. The first time Balak had sent messengers to him, he didn't tell the, them, God told me that uh, the Israelites are blessed, I cannot curse them. He didn't say that, because then it would have been the end of it. He kept always this open. He was always trimming off from the words of God in order to keep pursuing what he was pursuing he would do he would probably think to do the same thing now but um, it is uh, what is going to happen to him is what happened to the donkey God will take his mouth and, and make him speak and make him speak only that which God wanted him to say and that happens now in verse uh, 6 um, and this is usually referred to as the first prophecy of uh, Balaam and he returned to him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. So you get here this whole theater, you have these, these altars, this, this still smoking, burning sacrifices, all these high-ranked people standing there, and the king himself. And now, now the most powerful diviner is going to speak. He's going to speak the curse against these people that are down there. Um, and what does he say? He took up his parable. A parable is not a magic wand, but it means he's, he took up uh, his proverb, his speech. He, 
his, his message. And said, Balak, the king of Moab, had brought me from Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God had not cursed? How shall I defy whom the, whom the Lord had not defied? For f from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let, let my last end be like his. He spoke the words that God wanted him to spoke, and the last uh, sentence, we read it also last week, was, was probably a wish of himself that would, by the way, not come to pass, he will, that he would die the death of the righteous. He didn't live the life of the righteous, so he wouldn't die the death of the righteous. Um, he spoke these words, and then in verse 11, Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done to me? I took thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. This was such a, a disappointment. This should have been the climax of all this waiting and all these efforts. And now the opposite happens. What have you done to me? Totally unexpected. He was counting on a curse and not on this. He said, you, you actually blessed them instead. Uh, he, he trusted on Balaam's power and... Um, his reputation, it was widely known. How could this happen? He finds actually that Balaam is incapable of doing what he wanted him to do. Now, Balaam must have been also surprised himself about the words that came out of his mouth. He didn't want to speak these words. He wanted to curse Israel so that he could get his reward. This didn't help him at all. So what does he say? Uh, he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak? To speak? That which the Lord hath put in my mouth. He is humiliated by his own words. But more than that, he is standing on the high grounds of Baal. This is Satan's playground. Satan is humiliated very much. Because this is behind the scenes, of course. It's a spiritual battle going on there. Uh, it's a total failure. But um, even now... Balaam doesn't come to his senses and, and, and understand that God is in control and that he simply has to obey God. He doesn't say, Lord, I, I repent from this. Balak made me do it. I was driven by my, uh, my, my lust for power and riches. Uh, forgive me. No. He basically blames God again. Yeah. What else can I do? God told me to put these words in my mouth. I cannot do anything. Uh, it's, it's God's fault. It's not my fault. Um, and uh, he, he makes it into a question, his answer. He, he says, he doesn't say, he actually asks eh, to Balak, must I not take heed to speak which, that which the Lord had put in my mouth? What is your answer to that? Well, what do you expect that, um, that Balaam can, uh, Balak can say? Yeah, of course, okay. And then, apparently, we haven't pleased God in good enough so that he gives... Uh, this curse instead of a blessing. There is a spiritual battle going on behind the scenes and it is very intense. <coughs> and this whole story very much applies to us and our times. We saw, of course, the last uh, week uh, this donkey and this donkey is, is an, an, a type of the, uh, of the true disciple of Christ, the one who obeys God uh, no matter what, and even if he's persecuted for it. Um, but now we see Israel, the children of Israel. The children of Israel, they are likened to the church. And Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, <clears throat> where he says they were all baptized through the sea and the cloud, and they all drank from, uh, from the rock, uh, which was Christ. So he literally likens them to the church. And um, here is the church uh, right on the border of the, of the promised land. It's, it's the church at the end of the church age right before the moment to inherit the kingdom. So it's really the end time church that we are looking at. And 
Satan hates this with all that he has. He doesn't want this to happen. Because he knows also what's going to happen after that. He knows uh, his time is short. And, and, and so we see this here also. He doesn't want Israel to get, to, to get in their land and to prosper. He wants them destroyed. And this is what he, want, he, wants, he wanted right from, from the beginning. From Genesis 3, 15. When God says, the seed of the woman will crush your head. Or bruise your head. That is the moment that Satan has is trying to prevent the seed of the woman to, to exist. And so uh, that is the whole reason why, Cain, why he made Cain kill his brother. Because he thought Abel is the right one. This is the one through which um, the, the, um, the Messiah would come eventually. If I kill him, I stop it. Uh, after that, after that was that failure, he um, uh, he allowed these uh, angels to come down and go with uh, the, the women, uh, and from that the Nephilim came. So he was corrupting the seed of man for the very same reason to prevent the Messiah to come. Uh, that ended in the flood. After the flood, he continued the same way uh, through Nimrod with Babel. Um, again, God had to uh, intervene. And um, if we fast forward, um, when Moses was a child, we see the same thing. All the boys um, uh, of um, the Israelites had to be uh, what they were like called Israelites, of course, they were Hebrews. All these the boys uh, had to be killed, and that is why Moses ended up in this basket. Uh, so again, he failed there. And um, later on, we'll see it again with uh, Haman uh, in the story of Esther. Again, he wants to try to kill all the, um, the Israelites, all the Jews. And, and when Jesus is born, it's the same thing with King Herod. All the boys, two years and younger, to be killed. There's a reason why Joseph takes um, um, Jesus into Egypt for a short time. And um, then we have the crucifixion. It's the same thing. Jesus is now born. Uh, Satan tries to destroy him. And he, so he bruises the heel, but still, <laughs> there is victory actually on the on the cross, not a defeat. And even in our modern times, uh, we have the Holocaust. Uh, only, uh, yeah, we can still see it when we look back over our shoulder. Uh, it's not long ago. It was another attempt to eradicate the Jews, and even today, uh, the same battle is still going on in the Middle East. There is this spirit behind it that tries to get rid of God's people. And um, he cannot no longer prevent the Messiah from being born to be born, but he now is focusing on his return. And we know also from Revelation uh, 19 how that is going to end. But so that's the battle that's going on here. <clears throat> um, and this hatred against against the Jews and God's people, this cannot be explained in human terms. This can only be explained in this way. <coughs> and that's why what uh, we read the other time in Psalm 35 is, is uh, this is important, eh? where there it's King David, where he prays to God, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me, fight against them that fight against me. He understands that this is a battle that goes beyond uh, sending soldiers to, to the front line. It is spiritual. God is, uh, has, to be, um, has, has to intervene. And he does. Um, this does, by the way, not mean that the Israelites, and we'll get back to that also, uh, are all righteous. Um, just as the whole of the church is not righteous, but Individual Israelites are, as there are also ones that are uh, deceived and that are even wicked. We find the same in the church. When I read this, um, this verse 41, uh, it made a click in my mind that, verse 41 of uh, Numbers 22, that Balak to, took Balaam upon the high places of Baal, that he might see the utmost part of the people. What we didn't read is, is chapter 21, where um, Moses and the Israelites defeat the Amorites. And it, it says there in um, chapter 21, verse 25, And Israel took all these cities, so that's in Ammon, and dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, in Hezbon and in all the villages thereof. So they take, 
they take that land and they they dwell in the city in the cities. So you would think, well, if um, if Balaam is on this mountain, how can he see them? Because they are spread in all these cities and villages. But actually, that's not where they stayed. Uh, God had clearly instructed um, Moses that he should not take that land. So everything east of, uh, of the Jordan was not to be inhabited at that moment, at that point in time. It would, later it would change a bit, but now the focus was on everything uh, west of the Jordan, where, um, where these Nephilim tribes were. And so in, uh, if we fast forward to um, chapter 24, in verse 2, We'll get to that in a minute anyway, but it says that Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. So they didn't stay in the cities, they went back the way they had done 40 years to, to dwell in, in their tents, in their booths, in their uh, Sukkot. Uh, so that is what it is, but it says also there they were... Um, they, they were abiding in the tents according to their tribes. What does that mean? And we did this exercise when we studied the tabernacle. Um, and, uh, you can go through uh, Numbers uh, chapter 2, where all the tribes of Israel are uh, mentioned with the, um, the number of people in it. That's the, the, the males above 20. And um, they are, these 12 tribes are divided into four houses. And um, if you add up these, these numbers, you can get the, 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 the sizes of these four houses. And then it is also mentioned which house is on which side of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is in the center and you have four sides. So that is an exercise that, that I did back then to, um, to see how big is that. And when you actually project it um, in the camp, what do you get? You get, you get the cross. And so, what was Balaam looking on? He was looking on the camp, but what was he actually seeing? He was seeing the cross. Now, of course, Balaam had no idea what he was seeing. Uh, neither had Balak um, or any of them there. The cross did not exist. They had no concept of that. But God saw also the cross. He knew what it meant. Satan also saw it, and he knew what it meant. And so, we see um, here that God sees his church, he sees his people through the cross. And that makes all the difference. That, that makes um, um, God see them as righteous and um, having his grace upon them. And it, sees, it makes Satan see his defeat. He has no, no way to, to go beyond that. Um, but the words that uh, Balaam had now spoken, they should have been enough for Balak to understand that Israel was actually no threat. And uh, secondly, that he had no need to attack them. But just like Balaam, uh, Balak's heart was wicked. He was determined to do what he wanted to do, no matter what. And so, uh, just like Balaam, he would get seven chances. This was the first one. He would get seven chances, and he, just like Balaam, he would not change. And just like Balaam, it would bring him to his destruction. We go back to uh, chapter uh, 23, Numbers, and verse 13. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place, from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and thou shalt not see them all, and curse me them from thence. So he brings him to another place, a bit nearer to the camp, so that he doesn't have a total overview, but he is closer with them, and so he hopes that maybe this will make it more effective. So he, in his mind, he uh, first he was, of course, very displeased, but yeah, he has no other option than, than this. This is the most powerful diviner there is, so it has to work somehow. So let's go to another place. Maybe the effect will be different. Uh, that is the idea. And uh, you see that uh, Balaam doesn't say, I've spoken what the Lord told me to say. This is it. I'm going. No, he is after his reward. He consents and they go. And um, 
then uh, what uh, happens, uh, verse 14, and he brought him into the field of Zophim, that's a bit further, a um, little bit further to the east, but it, these places are very near to each other, they could see, walk there, um, uh, to the top of uh, Pishka and built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. We repeat the same thing. And he said to Balak, Stand here by thy burnt offering while I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord uh, met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again to Balak and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What the Lord, what had the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man, he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and had he not do, uh, do it, or had he spoken, and shall he not make it good? We see the same theater. It's, it's again a high place. Uh, again, seven altars, the whole ritual again. And um, Balaam is also um, keeping up his role as the, the diviner, the enchanter. You stay here with the altars. I will go a bit up and uh, I will speak with God again. And um, then, um, yeah, basically the same thing happens. God meets him again and uh, says, uh, you will speak, go back. But then this prophecy begins different from the other one. It says, um, after uh, Balaam took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. It is directly aimed at Balak. Get up eh, and, and listen carefully. Balak, the, the, the uh, devourer, eh, his name means... But he says, thou son of Zippor, you are the son of the sparrow, this frightened bird, because actually fear is what's driving him. You get up and now listen. This is for you. And then he says, God is not a man. In other words, I just told you what I told you, and you want me to, you want something else, to hear something else. I'm not like a man that you can persuade and make say something different. I didn't lie. Eh? I'm also not the son of man, which means I'm not a mortal. I'm, immor I'm, I'm eternal. So I, there's no need for me to repent, to change my ways. They are eternal, they are consistent, they never change. So he's, he's identifying some of his characteristics to this Balak. Don't you understand who you're dealing with? Apparently not, of course. But. So what I say is what I do. And what I've spoken, this is what it is. Nothing will change it. Men will change their minds, and men will break their words, and they lie, but God doesn't. And again, this has to make us think of how we approach God. Often when we pray, we don't get what we, what we desire. Do we do the same? Do we think that God is like a man, that we can uh, change his mind after he has shown us his way? Sometimes, yes, we need to, of course, persist in our request. But when he shows us something else, then we have to simply accept that. That is then his will. So, um, verse 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he had blessed, and I cannot reverse it. This is what it is. God is not a man. And uh, this is basically a slap in the face of Balak. It is it is uh, personally for him. And um, all his princes, they are there and they hear it. And basically, uh, yeah, they hear how, how silly he is to try to change God's mind. But um, it will not uh, help. Uh, verse 21. He had not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither had he seen perverseness in Israel. Talking about God. God has not seen any iniquity in, or perverseness in Israel. What we get now is, uh, after this, this address to Balak, is a description of Israel, of some of the characteristics of Israel that we can project on the church, on the true church of, of, of Christ. And the first one is that God does not see iniquity or perverseness. 
And you think, how can this be? But again, think what he sees. He sees the cross. He sees the cross. And this is, God is not a man. He doesn't see what we see. He, he sees something completely different. He sees his church. He sees the bride of, of Christ. And he sees them through his son. And I'm talking here about the true church, those that have indeed been redeemed through Christ. He sees them through Christ. And um, that makes all the difference. Uh, in Second Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul writes, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God. And who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the, mind, the ministry of reconciliation. We are reconciled through Christ, or Christ's righteousness is imputed upon us. That is what God sees when he looks upon uh, one of his children, or the church, the true church, redeemed by the blood of Christ. And therefore, uh, Balaam can say what he says here, that God sees no iniquity in them. Now, because it's very strange, because in the 40 years that God has been dealing with the Israelites, there is only iniquity. All the time they're rebelling and they're disobedient and all these things. <coughs> so what applies to, to those that are uh, redeemed by uh, Christ, it does not necessarily uh, apply to every individual. And, and we will see it, because this story continues, and... Balaam will have some success and it will um, cause the death of 24,000 of the Israelites because of their iniquity and unrighteousness. So that is also the reality. But be in Christ and God will see you through the cross. And then in verse 21, second half, it continues, The Lord, his God, is with him and the shout of a king is among them. So the first thing, the first characteristic of the truth true Christian of the tr or the true church is righteousness. The second one is God's presence. God is with them. What will you do, Balak, you, you worldly king? What are you going to do? You are so scared and here you are trying to attack the Israelites. Well, you have to deal with God because he is their king. You are actually attacking God's kingdom. That is exactly what's happening behind the scenes. Satan is attacking God's kingdom. And... Um, it's not going to work. Just like Balaam had been beating the donkey, it didn't change the donkey's mind. He was following God. And so God's plan will, will continue. It will not be um, obstructed by, uh, by what the enemy tries to do. Uh, and it continues then, And God brought him out of Egypt. This is also an interesting message that God gives here to Balak, because in the beginning, the very first time that um, Balak sent messengers to Balaam, in chapter 22, verse um, 5, uh, the message that he gives is, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. This is Balak's mindset, they came out of Egypt. God now tells him, I brought them out of Egypt. This is my doing. I'm working with them. Do you think I brought them out of Egypt to have them here cursed and killed by you? This is not going to happen. So God is with them. That is the message. And that is a great comfort for us. As last, uh, last day's church, God is with us. He did not bring us all the way here. 2,000 years of church history um, to have us here destroyed and killed. Again, being Christ, because thousands of the Israelites would be killed uh, only a little bit further uh, from this uh, in the future. So um, it's, it doesn't necessarily apply to every individual. God will carry on with his church until the very end. His bride is prepared and Jesus will come for her. And no one is going to stop it. So... Righteousness is one. God's presence is the second one. The third one comes now. Um, verse 22, second half. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. This is, um, this is King James language. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> a unicorn is a, a mythical figure that we find in, in um, uh, yeah, Greek mythology and, and, and other um, 
ancient uh, mythological stories, but it doesn't fit the whole Hebrew um, mindset. The word there is uh, Ra'am, um, and um, if maybe uh, in today uh, a, a fairy tale that has, um, or a mythical story that has a unicorn would be translated in Hebrew, they would use this word. But in the time that uh, scripture was written, and they would use this word, that would not mean unicorn, it means actually wild ox or a wild bull. Wild, it has this aspect of being wild, but it is an ox or a bull. And that um, points to strength. Strength, so God is with them, but they also have strength. Um, uh, Proverbs uh, 14, verse 4, says this, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is, I'm still reading from the King James Bible. It's the same word in Hebrew, but here they translate it with ox. So you see, sometimes it's not very consistent. Uh, where uh, no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. The ox is known for its strength. That's why it's used to, to uh, pull plows and do this heavy work. Uh, that's the ox. So. Um, that's uh, why it says here, uh, he has, as it were, the strength of a wild ox. An ox is strong, a wild ox uh, even more. Um, this is a warning to Balak. You want to fight them, you better, you better think twice. God is their king, he's with them, and they have strength like a wild ox. Don't provoke. This is the same to the church. The church might be peaceful, seem innocent, and all this, but there is strength. If it need be, then there is a crushing power. Um, and we see this uh, not so much in uh, the Western uh, churches. We see actually the opposite. They are Laodicean, they are lukewarm. But we see it very much in churches that are being persecuted. Uh, Iran, China, and, and other countries where there is lots of persecution in churches stronger than ever and growing. So uh, there is a lot of power. There's a lot of power there. Verse 23, Numbers 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what had God wrought? Balaam is still speaking. He is the enchanter. He is the diviner. <clears throat> and he is saying, my job, what I do, my profession, uh, it won't work against them. He's saying it with his own mouth. Um, here we get another um, characteristic of the church, and that is authority. It has authority over dark powers. They are without effect against them. This is Satan's territory. These are Satan's weapons. The powers of darkness that Paul writes about in Ephesians 6. They have no effect against the true church, they, uh, in which the, the soldiers are armed with the spiritual armor of God. And uh, to the Israelites, this was also strictly forbidden. In, um, in Leviticus 19, verse 26, God gives this instruction to uh, Moses, You shall not uh, eat anything with the blood, and then neither shall you use enchantment or observe times. None of these things you shall do. And in Numbers, uh, or in Deuteronomy 18, he makes it even stronger. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. These things are abominable to God. He doesn't want any of this. And these are the devices of Satan. They don't belong in, uh, among God's people or in the church. Which um, gives to show because we see them actually in many so-called churches. But anyway. Um, so there is authority over these powers of darkness. That is another thing. These are just man's ways to reach to God. Balaam and Balak, they were doing this with their sacrifices, their altars. They were trying to, to reach out to God and to use God for their purposes. This does not work. It's the other way around. God reaches out to man and he has done so through his son Jesus. And this is the only way we can actually reach him. 
Verse 24, Numbers 23. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift him, uh, up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Here we get another uh, characteristic of the church, of the true church of Christ. There is not only strength to defend like the ox, there is also strength to destroy. We see here that the uh, defensive goes to offensive. And, and Balak should be shaking even more now because now these people that are dwelling peacefully in the tents, they also have um, the, uh, the potential to, to attack, to destroy. And actually he knows it because they did it to the Amorites. Um, so we see both the ox and the lion, defensive and offensive, are in there. If there is a need, God will also use the church to destroy the powers of darkness. Uh, to make, to stir up his people that they become like a restless lion, like a young lion. He's restless, he wants to go out and, and go after uh, whatever is the, the prey, eh? until he drinks the blood of the slain. We don't take this literally, but uh, meaning until there is total defeat. There is no compromise. A lion, after a lion has set his eyes on a prey, he goes after it until he has it. He does never compromise on, on his prey. And so neither should we. When the enemy approaches us, attacks us, um, when he tries, uh, whatever he tries on us, then um, we do not compromise in no way. We must, we must seek its destruction must be eradicated. It must be eradicated from our lives. It must be eradicated, obviously, from the church. Uh, so, and yes, the church is a destroying institution. Destroying not uh, people and, and, and the material, but destroying powers of darkness. Destroying the, uh, the wiles of the enemy. Um, we never compromise with evil. And if you look at today's church, it's the opposite. It is only compromising with evil. It is lukewarm, it is accepting, it's tolerating, it's so-called inclusive. Uh, the evil things of the world that the world has embraced and is embracing, they are also being um, led into the church. And, and yeah, I can name them, uh, of course, again, uh, some of them at least, uh, the, the, uh, many yeah, churches, they are called churches, but they have now homosexual um, um, pastors or priests or whatnot. Um, there is a lot of um, uh, witchcraft going on and, and many evil things that are accepted into the church uh, and many things are tolerated. Um, euthanasia, and abortion, uh, all these things that they should not be part of, uh, of the church. That's the lukewarm church and that's why Jesus says in uh, Revelation, I, I, I Pew you out. It's, it's repulsive to him. He doesn't want these things. It's abominable. And that's why you see that it becomes harder and harder in, towards the end for us um, to, to, to live in this world, to operate in this world, and to also exist as a church. Um, and, and you see even the Pope said uh, last week that uh, fundamental, fundamentalist Christians are a crowd. They... they they are undesirable because they stand with the truth. They do not compromise. They do not accept all the evil things to come in. Um, the Vatican and, and many other church leaders, they rather see um, people like Balak following the Balams that they are. But we have to be like the lion and the ox. We continue, verse 25. Uh, and Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. So, so what, what, Balaam, uh, or what Balak means to say is, If you cannot curse them, then at least don't bless them. You're doing the opposite now. And he's very irritated. He's all, he was already disappointed the first time, but now he's also threatened by the strength and the, not only the defensive, even the offensive strength of Israel. And um, he's probably uh, inside more scared than ever now. Uh, but he's annoyed also. And um, 
he, with these words, he's basically saying, I don't want to have to do anything with you. If you cannot do your job, then at least don't make it worse for me. Yeah, just, just shut up. Um, but Balaam then, although he, he might have wanted otherwise, he couldn't do otherwise. Um, and he, uh, he does the same as before. He says, yeah, but I can only do what God uh, tells me to do. What God puts in my mouth. Again, God is to blame, not me. He wants to keep up his own image. Because uh, he's still after, uh, after his reward. Uh, although he will also see that it's getting, uh, the chances are getting less. And the men must have looked at each other, the devourer and the destroyer. What can we do now? Here we are with all our altars and, and burnt offerings and everything and um, nothing so far. Uh, there are no other options. Verse uh, 27, And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee to another place. Peradventure it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought... Um, uh, Balaam unto uh, the top of Peor. It's again a little bit further to the east. That look at toward Yeshimon. And Balaam said to Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. So, again, let's do the same theater in another place. Maybe it will work this time. Maybe, uh, he literally says, uh, Maybe uh, it will please God that you may curse the Israelites from there. You see how stubborn these men are and how hardened in their hearts to, to pursue their wicked agenda. Um, and so they just continue doing what they do. It's more sacrifices or we can say it's more bribery. They just have no clue about who this God is. God has already said, I'm not a man. I won't change what I've said, I've said. This is it. But they don't get it. And again, it's, it's sometimes we are like that. We just don't accept what God wants. We don't accept God's will. We're pursuing our will. We're going through to do what we want in spite of what God has shown to us or what he's showing through his word or otherwise. So uh, that's a very bad thing, of course. Now something changes in <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 24. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. Something changes. He thinks, I cannot have the same thing once again. And I have just spoken with my own mouth that there is no divination and no enchantment against the Israelites. So let's try something different. Uh -huh. It's not repentance. It's not that he turns to the Lord now. It's just trying a different tactic. <coughs> because, um, because he saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel. So let's play with that. Let's try this now. He's still negotiating. He's still negotiating. Verse 2. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents. And according to the tribes... And the Spirit of God came upon him. So this is the verse I read before. He sees basically the camp, the cross. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Many say, see, he has repented. Now the Holy Spirit indwells him. And he is now the prophet of God that he is supposed to be. Well, I uh, will show you that this is certainly not the case. He hasn't changed even uh, a iota, nothing. And um, what we actually see here is a wicked unbeliever. And so the question then is, can the Spirit of the Lord come upon the wicked unbeliever? Yes. Yes, it can. This is not the only example in Scripture, by the way, where we find this. God actually takes full control now. And Balaam, it's not only Balaam's lips that are taken over it will go further now. And it's very much the same that happened on the road. When, when first the donkey was uh, uh, making uh, it difficult for him to continue. And then the donkey began to speak. And then even his eyes were opened and he saw the angel. The same happens here. His eyes are opened and he will see more than um, what he saw so far. But in all of this, it doesn't change him. God is using him for his purpose, but it does not change him. 
um, verse 3. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, so he's speaking about himself, and the man whose eyes are open has said, so he's speaking about himself, eh? my eyes are now open. He has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are they spread forth, as the gardens by the riverside, as the trees of uh, line goes along, goes of line aloes with, uh, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. This is the wild ox again. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones, and pierce them through, pierce them through with his arrows. The couched he lay down, he couched he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion who shall stir him up. Blessed is he that blessed thee, and cursed is he that cursed thee. So, now um, the prophecy is no longer about um, Balak and about uh, Balaam and what they saw wrong. It's now totally focusing on God's people, on Israel. And again, we can project this on the, the end times church. God goes further. He doesn't just put words in Balaam's mouth. He makes him see visions. And he, he describes it himself. My eyes are open. I'm in a trance, but I'm awake. And then and, and he starts to, to describe what he sees. And um, he was looking at the camp. He was looking at the tents, as we, we just read. But he sees something, something more. And um, he saw actually their future. His heart was still desiring for their destruction, but what his heart was desiring was um, not so much of interest uh, to God. He was showing him what he wanted to show. God took full control of this ungodly man. And if you see how powerful God can be in, in, in an ungodly man, how much more powerful can he be in a godly man? And of, of course we have also those examples. It was evidence of God's power in Balaam. But there was zero evidence of God's grace. He did not. The, the, the hedges of protection, they are gone. God's blessings were flowing through Balaam, but uh, they were not for him himself. Actually, nor for those that were listening. And Balaam sees two things. He sees uh, the natural view of the camp, the arrangement of the, the tents, and um, we, we already said it looks like a cross, but then he sees... Through that, he sees the future of it. He sees the gardens, the, the waters, the cedars, um, all this, uh, this, this beautiful um, picture of, of um, nature and a land dwelling and, and prospering. This is what he sees. This is the future of, of this, these people that dwell in that tents here. And as God has said... Um, what I shall, that what I say, that is what what will happen. I do not lie. This is what it's going to be. So for Balak, it must have been, all, should have been clear. Don't try to fight them. This is this is what I have for them. To Satan, it should have been clear. But what we see here is the difference of the uh, between the internal and the external of the church. The external of the church to people. In the world, they are pitiful people, they are, uh, they are miserable, they don't enjoy all the things of the world, all the pleasures. Uh, they just uh, sit there with their hands folded and they read from the scriptures and um, they are just uh, miserable people. That's maybe the outside, but internal life is what is described here. It is beautiful gardens and valleys and waters, richness and, and prospering that is the inside uh, the tents that the Israelites dwell in these Sukkot they are temporal dwellings but when there are valleys and gardens and, and trees 
these are planted for, for eternity. This is the abundant eternal life. That's the internal life of the, the true church, the internal life of the true disciple of Christ. And he may be beaten like the donkey was, but inside there is something totally different and none of this can move him. This is what we see actually in the persecuted churches in China. People, they, they are literally beaten and, and uh, imprisoned and, and, and persecuted unto death, but it doesn't move them away from Christ. No way. And that's how we should be. What happens here to Balaam is uh, what many, um, many Christians wish for, that they would see these visions. And some boast about seeing them, which is very doubtful, but anyway. Um, but this is what the Spirit does. First Corinthians 2, uh, Paul describes uh, what I had not seen, nor ear heard, nor had come into the hearts of men. God will show to those that love him. That is the, what the Spirit does. Here is a man that does not love God, but God uses him in spite of that. So that's the first thing he sees. The second thing he sees here is Israel as a destroyer. He speaks again about the wild ox and about the lion. He's fierce, he's furious, he's strong. He's like a wild bull. And that is the way the church should operate against the enemies by the power of God. And uh, so that, that are the pictures that he's giving here. Now, when Balak hears, hears this, um, it's enough for him. In verse 10 of chapter 24, he says, um, Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And he smote his hands together. He was angry. And Balak said unto Balaam, I call thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them three times. 21 altars they made, 21 bullocks, 21 rams they sacrificed. All this theater going from here to there, and this is the result. He was very angry. And therefore, uh, now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promise to promote thee to great honor. But lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not as to thy messengers? which thou sendest unto me, that was the first time that he sent them, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind. But what the Lord said, that will I speak. And now behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. Very interesting and dynamic here between these two, the destroyer and the devourer. The, now it's over, Balak is dismissing um, Balaam, he, he, he doesn't need him anymore. But he's reminding him of the great rewards that he had for him. Didn't I tell you, I can exalt you to great honor. Again, he doesn't mention the silver, the gold, the honor. And, and because that is what, what Balaam lusts for most of all. And uh, the interesting thing is that... Um, Again, the way Balaam answers. He understands that this part of the mission has failed and he cannot do much, but um, he does again um, say, yeah, well, I, I, just, uh, I cannot go beyond what God tells me to do. And again, he's blaming it on God, but he also reminding Balak of what he said to his messengers before. Didn't I tell that if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold? He doesn't mean this hyperbolic. He means that's actually maybe what you should do. You should maybe give me a bit more. Uh, then maybe we can get somewhere. But um, obviously not for this time. Balak is, is done with him. And um, Balaam is basically um, also done with God. With, with proclaiming God's word. Because it hasn't helped him. But... He says, okay, I go, I will go. Uh, but then he, he ends, strangely enough, I say, well, but I will advertise you, I will tell to you what these people, the Israelites, will do to your people in the latter days. What well, now? In the latter days would be uh, actually uh, you know, 3,000 years more than from that time. 
he is proclaiming what's going to happen in the, in the end times. So without him willing to do so, there is another prophecy. God is not done with him, with using him. There is something else he has to proclaim, and that is to come now. And this is, again, uh, the spiritual battle behind the scenes. Satan is using these men here to go against, against God. And it, it's really embarrassing what, what he gets in return. Um, in verse 15, and we, we quickly wrap it up now. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Again, he describes his own state. And um, yeah, this, is, this should be such a blessing as, as, a, as a prophet to, to be in this position, but to him it's meaningless, it's undesired even. But God uses him anyway. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and all the children of Seth. And Adam shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Here he is prophesying the coming Messiah. He is actually speaking about Jesus, the star out of Jacob. This has been by rabbis in the past mistaken with um, Bar Kochba, which means uh, star out of the east. His name, they thought he was the Messiah because they had already rejected Jesus, but we know who it speaks about. The scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab. So this is for the latter days. <coughs> but it becomes even more blatant to Balak. Moab will be utterly destroyed. And, and so would Adam be and, and other places that he's mentioning. But he's prophesying here the coming Messiah. Satan is behind the scenes trying to prevent his head from being crushed. And God is speaking here through the mouth of, of one of Satan's children, basically. This, this diviner, this enchanter, he's speaking exactly those words. You can, there's nothing you can do. He will come and he will destroy. And then in verse 20, And when he looked upon Amalek, now, by the way, the prophecies will go to the different areas that were very known to Balak. So he will, he will learn that what happened to the Amorites will befall all these, these peoples, groups that will come against Israel. Um, so it begins with Amalek. And he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked upon the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is, his, is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenites shall be wasted until Ashur shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, uh, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim, and shall afflict Ashur, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish forever. These are all future prophecies of the destruction of these lands. Um, and it's interesting that he speaks about ships coming in to the coast of Ashur. And we see it actually today, the ships, the naval ships coming in to the, uh, through the Mediterranean to the coast of Syria, uh, there in uh, the, the, the harbors of Syria. So the Ashur it's, um, was a larger region, but that now uh, Syria and Iraq is in this area. And the other places mentioned there um, are in today's Jordan. And he mentions also Eber. Eber, maybe you remember the name when we went through the genealogy of, of Jesus. Eber is one of the descendants of Abram. Eber or Heber in, in English. And that's where we get the name Hebrew. Evrit in, in, uh, in the Hebrew language. So anyway, this is also, are all kinds of people groups and tribes. So, it's very clear what he's displaying here. History will progress and there will become there will come other people groups and other nations against Israel, but this is what their end will be. God has a plan and he will finish it. 
Then finally, Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. And this was the last these two men would see from each other, although their um, the future work would co- would would cro- will cross each other again. But uh, this is it: the devourer and the destroyer. They have come together. They have tried to devise, uh, but they could not even speak a curse, let alone do anything practical against Israel. All the while, Israel is just dwelling in his tents, not knowing anything of this. Again, this is what happens also in our uh, lives um, as believers, but also as um, as the church. There is a spiritual betting go- battle going on uh, that we are, for the major part, not even aware of. The God is in control. And that is what we read from uh, Psalm 35, the first three verses the other time. The church is blessed. Israel is blessed here. The church is blessed likewise. But this does not mean every individual believer is is blessed and saved and uh, has this prosperous future. There will be a sifting before the kingdom, uh, before we inherit the kingdom. The tares and the wheat will be separated, and we will see the same next time. In uh, also in this story, before Israel enters the land, there will be a sifting, and it is not a nice thing. So, Balak and Balaam split, but the story is not yet over. So, will to be continued. I will say. Amen.